We're now going to go through the digestive system and for three questions it's quite a complicated system but iTech do want you to know what happens to proteins, carbohydrates and fats when you eat them in the body and how does the body turn that into substances that it can utilize. So we're going to cover the digestive system over the next group of slides. The digestive system consists of the alimentary canal. The alimentary canal is the tube that runs from the mouth to the anus and along the way we're going to be talking about the mouth and the salivary glands, the tongue, the teeth, the pharynx, the epiglottis, the esophagus that runs down to the stomach, what happens in the stomach with what enzymes, and then continuing into the small intestine, the jejunum, the ileum, the duodenum, the ileocecal valve, moving on to the large intestine, and three accessory organs, the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas, as well as the appendix, the rectum, and the anus. The mouth has a hard bone at the top of it called the palatine bone covered by a soft fleshy palate behind and the mouth includes the tongue, the teeth, the salivary glands and the tongue is a large muscular structure covered with a membrane attached to the mandible by the hyoid bone at the back of the pharynx and covered with papillae or tiny projections um, and has a rough top to it, a rough feel to it. The functions of the tongue are tasting, chewing, swallowing, cleaning the mouth, rolling the food into a bolus so it can be easily swallowed and it's covered by taste buds that are sensitive to four different types of food, sweet at the front, salt is at the front either side and it's usually the salt taste buds that if I eat too many peanuts I get mouth ulcers on and the back at the side are the sour taste buds and the bitter is at the very back so if you imagine yourself sucking a bitter lemon you can almost feel the taste of that bitter lemon at the back of your throat. There is now a fifth taste bud which is not in your syllabus but that apparently is savoury although I'm not sure exactly where these savoury taste buds present themselves. So the tongue is aiding in chewing and it's pushing food between the teeth, rolling the food into a bolus, pushing it to the back of the mouth, ready for swallowing into the pharynx at the back of the throat. Adults have 32 teeth in our mouths four types of teeth, there's canines, incisors, molars and premolars. The canines are the ones at the front, then we have the incisors tend to be the sharper ones, the molars are the big ones at the front of the back and the premolars are the ones at the very back. So 32 teeth in our mouths for chewing, grinding, biting and chopping up food. You have three pairs of salivary glands. The salivary glands are parotid in the cheek, sublingual under the tongue, submandibular under the jaw. Saliva is a, a liquid mainly made of water but with mucus as well and within the saliva we have our first enzyme that we come across in the body. This is the enzyme amylase. An enzyme is a biological catalyst made of protein. A catalyst means that it starts a chain of events. The function of saliva is to lubricate food with mucus and make it more moist, to keep the teeth and the mouth clean, and to break down starch or carbohydrates with the enzyme amylase into polysaccharides. So this is the first enzyme that we come across and it's found in the mouth and it breaks down carbohydrates from the chips, bread, pasta, cake, 
cakes, biscuits, crisps that we've eaten into polysaccharides. Now poly means many, saccharides is another name for sugar. So we've now turned these carbohydrates with the help of amylase, our first carbohydrate enzyme, into polysaccharides. Once we've chewed our food, the tongue rolls the food into a bolus or a ball and pushes it to the back of the mouth. Amylase has already broken down our carbohydrates into polysaccharides. Nothing happens to fats and proteins in the mouth. The pharynx is the tube that runs down the back of the mouth. The epiglottis is a flap that goes down over the bronchial tubes when we swallow to stop the food going down into the bronchial tubes but to help it go down into the esophagus and then into the stomach. So it's the action of the back of the throat and the tongue pushing the food into the pharynx and then into the esophagus that helps us to swallow. The epiglottis is a small flap of cartilage which is part of the larynx that when we swallow flaps across and blocks the bronchial tubes which we can see here in the bottom right. You can see there the epiglottis has flapped over and the yellow piece of food is going down the esophagus instead of into the lungs. So it stops food going down the wrong way and it's found in the larynx. I tech have asked that question quite a lot and it's made of cartilage. The esophagus is a muscular tube that runs from the pharynx to the stomach. It's lined with squamous epithelium with goblet cells that secrete mucus to moisten the food as it passes. And along the walls it has a muscular wall and the movement of food passing through the elementary canal is known as peristalsis. As the muscles contracting behind the food relax and the bolus is pushed then by the muscles contracting in front of the food and that's how the food passes along. So it's peristalsis and bile has an action on stimulating peristalsis, particularly in the duodenum, to try and evacuate then the food out of the digestive system as quickly as possible. The stomach is an elastic J-shaped organ full of layers of muscle tissue which expands to fill and contracts to empty. These, um, the lining is sort of in folds called rugae and it's covered in a mucous membrane to help a protect the lining of the stomach from the acidity of the hydrochloric acid. The Latin for stomach is gastro and gastritis is the name for inflammation of the stomach. So if you see gastric, gastro written anywhere, then that should lead you to indicate that it's to do with the stomach. The functions of the stomach are to digest proteins. We're now going to have enzymes produced in the stomach that's going to break down proteins. So nothing happens to carbohydrates or fats in the stomach. It's all down to the proteins here. Also, the stomach churns food with gastric juices, absorbs the alcohol through the lining of the stomach and lubricates with mucus. And the whole acid content of the stomach is there to kill off bacteria. So this is the first line of defense should we eat any contaminated food or swallow any nasty bacteria into our stomachs the high acid content of the stomach will kill off bacteria but enzymes really like it so they like the acidity. The gastric juices that are present in the stomach we've got three of them hydrochloric acid, renin and pepsin. Hydrochloric acid is what provides the correct pH level for enzymes to thrive and to kill off bacteria. Also this hydrochloric acid activates pepsin to be produced to break down proteins. 
Renin is an enzyme that is produced only in infants that helps to curdle milk protein and helps us to metabolize milk. Pepsin is an enzyme that is present in the stomach and helps to convert proteins to peptones. So it's here in the stomach that proteins, the food we've eaten like fish, meat, nuts, all the protein we eat are converted into peptones with pepsin. And if you ever did the Pepsi Cola experiment at school where you took a glass of Pepsi Cola and you put a lump of meat in it overnight, you'd find in the morning that the meat had disappeared. Pepsin breaks down proteins to peptones in the stomach. The small intestine essentially looks like a pile of sausages. It's divided into the duodenum, the jejunum and the ileum. Um, but from my text point of view, the duodenum really is what we need to focus our attention as that's the last place that nutrients really get absorbed and broken down in the body. So quite a lot happens to the digestion of fats, proteins and carbohydrates in the small intestine. The duodenum's inner layer has little villi projections like little finger-like projections which increase the surface area and maximize the absorption of nutrients. The muscle wall helps to perform peristalsis, pushing the contents through the small intestine as quickly as possible. There's lots of blood vessels, copious amounts of lymph and nerves, so that we can absorb as many nutrients as possible through the lining of the duodenum. So the functions of the duodenum are to complete chemical digestion, to protect the digestive system from infection and to maximize the nutrient absorption either through the villi into the blood or the lymphatic system. In the duodenum we have villi. These are finger-like projections which increase the surface area of the villi and improve the absorption of nutrients. Inside each villi finger there is a network of capillaries and lacteals which are the name of the lymphatic vessels in the digestive system and it's the blood capillaries inside the valves that absorb the proteins into the bloodstream so that we can um, deliver amino acids all around the body and it's the fats that absorb into the lacteals of the lymphatic system. The pancreas is an accessory organ that leads into the duodenum. It's behind the stomach between the duodenum and the spleen and it produces pancreatic juices which it releases into the duodenum via the pancreatic duct. The pancreas is an exocrine gland because it has a duct. The islets of Langerhans and the capillary blood supply is what helps to produce insulin. So it's also one of the endocrine glands because it produces hormones. Its function is to work closely with the digestive and the endocrine system to break down food. It produces insulin which regulates blood sugar levels in the body and produces glycogen which increases blood sugar converting glycogen to glucose. But here for the purposes of the digestive system it produces three pancreatic enzymes that help to break down food. Lipase is another name for the fat enzyme produced by the pancreas that turns fat into fatty acids and then into glycerol. Amylase we've already had in the mouth. The pancreas also produces amylase so that it can break down carbohydrates into glucose. And trypsin is also produced by the pancreas. Trypsin breaks down protein to amino acids. So these three enzymes are secreted by the pancreas through the duct into the duodenum where the lipase breaks down the fats, the amylase continue the breakdown of carbohydrates and the trypsin 
breaks down the protein into amino acids. So back to this morning testing, we have peristalsis mixing all these interstinal pancreatic juices with bile. The pancreatic juices trips in turns proteins, the peptones into polypeptides, the lipase turns the fatty acids into glycerol and the amylase turns the polysaccharides into disaccharides. Now the interstinal juices are maltase, sucrase and lactase. They convert the disaccharides to monosaccharides and the peptidasis converts proteins, the polypeptides, into amino acids. Now all of this is happening at the same time so it's difficult to get an actual idea of what the process is but I will recap this later on. The nutrients are absorbed through the villi, the fats, fatty acids, glycerol absorbs into the lacteals of the lymphatic capillaries and the amino acids and sugars pass through the hepatic portal vein to the liver. The gallbladder is pear-shaped, looks like an avocado and sits posteriorly to the liver. It has two ducts, a cystic duct and a bile duct and it is a storage for bile. The liver produces bile and sends it via the bile duct to the gallbladder. The functions of the gallbladder are to act as a reservoir for bile, to secrete mucus into the bile to make sure that it doesn't get too dry and to absorb any water out of the bile if it gets a bit too liquid and to contract to empty bile into the duodenum when fats are present in the duodenum. The bile is made of a thick liquid made of broken down red blood cells. These contain salts, pigments, acids and water. The function of bile is to emulsify and break down fats. Emulsification means liquefy. Stimulating peristalsis in the small intestine. It also creates an alkaline condition in the small intestine when the contents of the stomach come out from the stomach into the small intestine they're very acidic so we need something very alkaline to counterbalance the acidity in the small intestine. The liver is an accessory organ of the digestive system. It's the largest gland and it sits at the top of the abdomen below the diaphragm. Hepatic is a Latin term that refers to the liver. The hepatic artery and the hepatic portal vein supply the liver with blood and nutrients. The functions of the liver are to remove, store, produce and convert different things. It removes toxins, drugs, alcohol, nitrogen from amino acids, a lot of toxins and waste products from the body that we might drink or ingest in some way. It also stores Vitamins, glycogen, fats and iron. And sometimes ITEC might ask you in a question what vitamins are stored by the liver. So if you change around vitamin A, B12, D, E and K, it spells baked a dozen, which is a lot easier to remember. The liver is very much involved in the removal of drugs and alcohol from the body and also the production of iron and the storage of iron in the body. And when I was uh, younger, my aunt used to eat raw liver sandwiches in order to get her iron into her body, which was before iron tablets came on the market. It produces heat by fat metabolism. It also is very involved in the clotting of blood. The plasma proteins that help to clot blood, like the albumin, globulin, prothrombin and fibrinogen, are all involved in the clotting of blood. They are produced by the liver. So is an anticoagulant called heparin, which helps to break down a clot. So the balance of clotting in the body is very much a liver function. And if your liver is not functioning properly, then you could well end up with either too many clots 
or not enough clotting going on in the body. We talked about bile. It's produced by the liver and stored in the gallbladder. Uric acid is also produced by the liver. So again, gout and liver function is often interlinked. And people who drink too much alcohol may well end up with a problem with the liver, which then affects the uric acid production. They could end up with overproduction of uric acid, which would give them gout as well. Urea is a byproduct of protein metabolism. So the liver helps very much to break down proteins as well. It also converts saturated fat to cholesterol. So if we eat a lot of saturated fat in our diet, then it's the liver that turns saturated fat to cholesterol. We don't want to have the wrong type of cholesterol in the body because that then ends up in our blood vessels and ends up clogging them up and causing maybe atherosclerosis or an atheroma which restricts the flow of blood through the arteries and veins. So it also helps to convert glycogen to glucose, glucose to glycogen when insulin is present and helps to metabolize proteins. So the liver is an enormously valuable organ. It does have the ability to repair itself. And if we overdo the alcohol and have problems with liver function tests, if we stop drinking for a month, the liver will repair itself. In a transplant, if you transplant 60% of the liver into somebody else's body, then the other liver will regrow to its entirety 100% of a new liver. It has enormous powers of recuperation, but it is a very, very vital organ for us in terms of removal of toxins, storing nutrients, producing different vital components of blood clotting and converting fats and glucose and glycogen. The large intestine is 1.5 meters long and is arch shaped. It contains the cecum, the appendix, the colon, the rectum and the anus. The functions of the large intestine are to reabsorb any water, nutrients, salts and vitamins that may still be in the contents, to lubricate the feces with mucus, to act as a storage short term of feces until evacuation. The excretion of waste is known as defecation and it's a mass movement stimulated by food arriving in the stomach. When we eat food, the stomach gives out a message for the large intestine to empty its contents. So quite often a call of nature to go to the toilet will coincide with us having eaten. If you have any young children, you can testify to the fact that it's, they take so long to eat that quite often this call of nature will send them rushing off to the loo before they finish their meal. If we don't listen to the call of nature, and we ignore it because we're on our way to work or we're on a bus and it's not convenient, then the contents will stay there longer than it needs to and it'll start drying out. And this is when we start suffering from constipation. Feces is unwanted food like cellulose, dead blood cells, fatty acids and bacteria. And the color comes from blood cells in the form of bilirubin or bile pigment. Black poo often might show you that there's blood in the poo or it could come from beetroot or if you've eaten high levels of iron the poo might well go black. The cecum is a small pouch at the entrance to the large intestine. It's just as the small intestine of the ileum empties the contents into the large intestine. It's also known as the ileocecal valve, this area. The valve stops food returning back into the small intestine. Also in this picture, you can see a, a tiny little sort of centipede um, type object. That's the appendix. It's a narrow tube about nine centimeters long made of lymphatic tissue. And it's the last remnants of what is thought to be a tail and it would have also helped us 
to digest food like grass when we were eating a different diet altogether. The colon is divided into three sections. There's the ascending colon on your right, there's the transverse colon going across the middle, and the descending colon is your left. So the rectum then comes the end of the descending colon, and this is 12 centimetres long, and it passes through the pelvic cavity to the anus. The anus has got two sphincters or openings, the inner involuntary sphincter and the outer voluntary sphincter. When we get the call of nature to go and evacuate our bowel, the inner involuntary sphincter opens and leaves us to relax and open the outer more voluntary sphincter. A recap of the carbohydrate breakdown. Carbohydrates are eaten and in the mouth the saliva contains amylase which breaks down the carbohydrates to polysaccharides. Nothing happens in the stomach to carbs as we digest them but in the duodenum the pancreas secretes more amylase into the duodenum of the small intestine which converts the polysaccharides to disaccharides. And then in the small intestine, we have interstinal juices, maltase, sucrase and lactase, and these break down the disaccharides to monosaccharides. So the eight enzyme breakdown of carbohydrates into different types of saccharides come in different stages. And they start off as polysaccharides, which are multiple sugars, disaccharides, which means two sugars, and monosaccharides, which means simple sugars. By the time the sugar is absorbed through the villi into the hepatic portal vein, it's known as glucose. Protein breakdown, just to recap. The first place that protein is broken down in the body is in the stomach. The hydrochloric acid activates pepsin and pepsin converts the proteins to peptones. Then in the duodenum the pancreas produces trypsin and trypsin breaks down those peptones to polypeptides. Then in the small intestine Peptidasis, which is an intestinal juice, that converts polypeptides to amino acids. And the villi then absorb those amino acids into the hepatic portal vein of the blood circulation. Recapping the fat breakdown then, nothing happens to fats when we eat them when we swallow them in the stomach until we get to the duodenum. The bile that is produced by the liver but stored in the gallbladder emulsifies the fats turning them to a liquid and then lipase which is produced by the pancreas and released into the duodenum helps to emulsify and break down the fats into fatty acids and then glycerol. In the small intestine, this is absorbed through the lacteals of the lymphatic system and then deposited into the bloodstream. Anorexia nervosa is considered a psychological condition where people have a false phobia about their weight. They see themselves as being fat and they take laxatives sometimes and make themselves vomit in order to lose weight, which induces severe weight loss. We're talking about people who may be five stone. By the time they get to five stone, normally they would be admitted to hospital. Because of this considerable amount of weight loss, they wouldn't be having any periods. They'd be suffering from amenorrhea their body would be shutting down in order to preserve life, really. Eventually, when all the fat tissues have been burnt off, the body would start breaking down itself and breaking down proteins that we need 
So anorexics do often die because of the amount of weight loss and their body starts to eat proteins that they need. Appendicitis is inflammation of the appendix. Quite often acute appendicitis happens in the young. It starts with abdominal pain, normally on the opposite side of the appendix, and it's very tender to touch. Quite often after you've had a bout of appendicitis, they would remove your appendix, although um, unnecessary operations are not done as frequently these days. Bulimia nervosa is insatiable overeating. It's a binge purge syndrome. It's supposed to be a neurological malfunction of the hypothalamus. Psychologically, very linked to anorexia, again, as it's an eating disorder. Cancer of the bowel is the third commonest type of cancer. It can be hereditary. If your parent had cancer of the bowel, then it's very likely that you could suffer from the same type of cancer. Quite often it's people who have a low fibre diet or maybe are very inactive that suffer from cancer of the bowel. The symptoms are quite often blood in your faeces, um, a change in your bowel habits, maybe unexplained weight loss, tiredness or breathlessness, or maybe an abdominal lump or swelling. Candida is a fungus related to yeasts which is found in the mouth and in the digestive system. Celiac disease is inherited autoimmune disease. Um, it affects the lining of the small intestine damage from eating either gluten or other proteins found in wheat, barley, rye and possibly oats. It's quite a serious condition and people do need to follow a strict diet throughout their lives to avoid having the symptoms from the celiac disease. Colitis is known as inflammation of the colon. Constipation, it's a frequent disorder which can be um, associated with uncomfortable bowel movements. Stools are hard like pellets and it's often because of the water absorption. The longer faeces stays in the large intestine, the more water is absorbed. Quite often caused by lack of exercise, maybe lack of fibre in the diet, um, being highly stressed, no time to go to the toilet. So that's constipation, often a side effect of many different disorders. Crohn's disease, this is an inflammatory condition of the digestive tract. Diabetes mellitus is a disorder of the pancreas where there's insufficient insulin to counterbalance the amount of sugar there is in the blood. Hyperglycemia means that there's too much sugar in the blood. Hypoglycemia means there's too little sugar in the blood. Type 1 diabetes used to occur in childhood and children would be born with a malfunction of the pancreas. This meant that they became idem. Idem stands for insulin dependent diabetes mellitus. Type 2 diabetes used to always occur in adults and this is a non-insulin diabetes, diabetes mellitus. So non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus. This means that the adults would be controlled using a diet and they would have um, to measure how much carbohydrate they ate during the day and take urine samples to measure to make sure that the sugar wasn't getting out of hand. It's quite dangerous for somebody to have too much or too little sugar in the body. They can go into a coma and um, it is controlled by giving insulin dependent diabetics an injection. But again, they do have to monitor their sugar intake and make sure that they have some way of taking immediate sugar should they feel that their sugar levels have become low. So this is a disorder of the pancreas.
diabetes mellitus. Diabetes insipidus is a rare metabolic disorder where you feel constantly thirsty and you produce enormous quantities of urine and this is a deficiency of vasopressin or antidiuretic hormone. These hormones regulate the reuptake of water in the kidneys. But it is quite a rare condition. But having said that, ITEC do tend to like quite to ask quite a few questions about diabetes insipidus and diabetes mellitus. Diverticulitis is inflammation of the diverticulum of the small intestine. Diverticulosis are pockets or blind pouches in the small intestine in the diverticulum which are age related and maybe even genetic. Quite often this is asymptomatic, people don't even know that they have these little pockets. Enteritis is inflammation of the intestines. Gallstones come about when the gallbladder is not working properly and is maybe absorbing too much water from the bile which means that some of it solidifies and forms little stones. Gallstones can be asymptomatic or they can be very painful. They can be little and jagged or the whole gallbladder can be full of one big large stone. If the stones start to move in the biliary system and walk through the cystic duct or the bile duct, then this can be really painful. Usually, if you have a large gallstone, you can opt to have laser treatment, which will break it down to lots of little stones. Or if you have little stones, you might have to have your gallbladder out, which they do through keyhole surgery these days. Gastritis is inflammation of the lining of the stomach. Gingivitis, gingiva stands for gums, that's inflammation of the gums. And heartburn is burning sensation that in the back of the throat or up through the esophagus where the stomach acids pass back into the esophagus from the cardiac sphincter of the stomach. A hernia is a protrusion of an organ or tissue through a cavity in the body. The hiatus hernia is in the stomach area, the inguinal in the lower abdomen, and the umbilical is usually in babies where the abdomen protrudes. An inflamed gallbladder is inflammation of the gallbladder. Irritable bowel syndrome or IBS is a sort of generic term for anything really related to the bowel. Often a spastic colon causes nervous diarrhea. Um, it's a disorder of the motility of the colon, so you can have an alternation of constipation one minute, diarrhea of another with pain and bloating. Jaundice is excessive levels of bile pigment in the blood, which means that the skin tends to turn yellow and the whites of the eyes. This is usually a malfunction of the gallbladder or the bile flow being obstructed from the liver to the gallbladder for storage. Liver cirrhosis is chronic damage and hardening of the liver due to excess alcohol consumption normally. A liver function test can tell you what state the liver is in a blood test, but the liver can re re regularly repair and damage itself if the damage is minimal and if the alcohol is stopped. But by the time you have cell death in the liver, which is hardening and permanent damage, that can't repair itself. Pernicious anemia is a defective formation of the red blood cells through lack of vitamin B12. Quite a serious condition. The blood cells' um, ability to carry oxygen is affected, and that's pernicious anemia. An esophageal ulcer is a persistent breach in the body's surface in the esophagus. So it's, it's a painful erosion in the esophagus. Obesity is a medical condition which is very, very common these days and it's excessive body weight that adversely affects health. 
it reduces life expectancy and increases health problems. Stress causes anxiety and when we get anxious we produce more gastric juices, digestive juices which attack the lining of the stomach and as a result we can suffer from IBS or an ulcer. An ulcer is an erosion of the wall of the digestive tract. You can have an ulcer anywhere along the wall of the digestive tract where there's too much acid production and this eats through the wall. It's very sore. Often stress is the cause or a malfunction. You can have a gastric ulcer, a duodenal ulcer, a peptic ulcer, and an aphthous ulcer is a mouth ulcer. So aphthous is another name for a mouth ulcer. I take like you to think about the digestive system in relation to other systems and it relates to the all systems really by providing nutrition and energy for every system in the body but particularly the circulation is what transports those nutrients to every cell in the whole body. The endocrine secretes hormones that aid the digestive process. The lymphatic vessels are what absorb the fat through the lacteals of the lymphatic system. And the muscular system forms peristalsis, that's the peristaltic action in the muscles of the alimentary canal push the contents through the digestive tract and supplies glucose for energy. The nervous system is what supplies communication to the brain to help the processes in the body take place.